Divine Truth Assistance Group. These group assistance sessions are about putting principles of divine truth into action. This discussion is part of the 2014 Australia Group 2 series. Mary presents Challenging Addictions, filmed on the 31st of July 2014 in Monterey, New South Wales, Australia. This is part one. How are you guys all going? Still fired up? It's been a lot of content today. <laughs> um, I'm going to present to you some information about challenging addictions. What I want to do with this talk is give you some tools and help you to try to understand a little bit the process that you're going to have to go through to properly release an addiction. Properly release this addiction that's driving many things in your life, whatever that addiction is. A lot of you by now have intellectual awareness of, the, of this whole cycle, really, don't you? You know, you have a lot of intellectual awareness. And hopefully what I'm going to talk about today is some tools to help you shift from intellectual awareness into emotional awareness and growth. Oh, look, someone's come to join us. G'day, mate. All right, let's see. Yep. So the first reminder I want to make before I begin is that the deconstruction process that Jesus described for you guys yesterday, from having intellectual awareness, intellectual desire to find out what this injury is all about, so in this case with the addictions, have an intellectual awareness of the addiction, an intellectual desire to discover what's driving it, and to have an intellectual idea maybe of what it is, you're still going to have to go through that process with all of your addictions, almost all of them, before you move into this emotional awareness and then emotional change. What I'm going to talk to you about is the steps after you have the emotional awareness and the emotional inkling of what it's about. So this is hopefully the next step for a lot of you guys. Sound all right? Okay, I'll just skip through that. So before I start, I want to talk to you just about my journey with what I'm about to present to you. What I'm going to describe is the process of beginning to take personal responsibility for your addictions. And that is, ah, I have an addiction and it's my responsibility to deal with it. It's you going, oh, I feel a compulsion, or I feel an addiction just got met, or I feel it didn't get met, and I'm going to do something different. It's you deciding for yourself and undertaking that process personally. Now, what happened for me in the beginning of my journey of rediscovery with divine truth was that I had a lot of external challenges to my addictions. Moving in with Jesus does that. So, and do you remember the other day when I was talking about the will to love? And I did that practical demonstration with Cornelius where I was holding the weight and he was lifting it for me. When, some, when you have an addiction in play and somebody and your circumstances are challenging it continually, you might do a little bit of emotional work, but you aren't lifting the weight yourself. The external circumstances are. So you're not really growing your will to change and grow and to love. Does that make sense? So that was me for a long, long time. And that was because of three main factors. Because, I mean, it's pretty surprising, isn't it? I'm Mary Magdalene. I love hearing about God's truth. I love all this stuff. I'm passionate about it. And yet I really wasn't exercising my will to love very much. Only until recently have I begun to engage the process that I'm going to talk to you guys about today. So there was three major things stopping me from engaging this practical and emotional challenge of addictions, taking personal responsibility for it. Does anyone have any idea what those three things might be? Or one of them, yeah, Kel? Well, 
one at least, um, wanting somebody else to do it for me. I did want someone else to do it for me. That's right. Why did I want someone else to do it for me? There was I, some. I haven't engaged my will. That's right. So if let's think back to Cornelius's talk on the first day. It was about the desire for personal change, or the fear of personal change, really, wasn't it? And what were three major things that he outlined that prevent us actually desiring to change for ourselves? Kati? Thank you. Uh, was one of them faith in God? Yep, so a lack of faith. Lack of faith in God. A lack of faith in God, yes. Anto? Like in faith in myself to do it. Yes. Yeah. So these were big factors for me. Because of the injuries that I have in this incarnation, I had zero faith in my capacity to change and grow. I didn't I loved the idea of God and I I felt this I felt like it I know it's true, but I don't believe it from a soul perspective anymore. I don't have faith that these things that I can change. So do I really want to challenge my addictions? This is the only place where I feel like I'm getting any happiness or fulfilment in my life, which if you think about Jesus' discussion with Justin just now, that's really what he identified, wasn't it? The only times he was feeling good was when his addictions were getting met. So if I acknowledge that, wow, no, this is the only thing I consider good in my life is when my addictions are met. And I don't have any faith that I can even change. There's no incentive, is there? What was the second thing that Cornelius talked about? Lorraine? Uh, resistance to truth. That was the third thing he mentioned. Who um, can tell me the second line? Lani, um, allowing the overwhelm of emotion. So a terror of being emotionally overwhelmed. That was certainly me. I, I have big, intense emotions and I was trained from very young in this incarnation that I didn't have to feel them. That in fact, it was okay and we'd hug it out and you don't ever have to feel that distressed or upset or sad or lonely or anything. So I was terrified of being emotionally overwhelmed. And this prevented a desire to challenge my addictions because guess what? When we challenge our addictions, there's going to be some emotions involved. And what was the third thing? Lorleen mentioned it already, a resistance to truth. Now, I did have this on my side in that I do have a love for truth. It did pull me through a lot of stuff, <laughs> this seeking feeling inside of me of wanting truth. But I had to work through resistance to it as well. You know, I didn't just waltz on into Jesus' life and go, just tell me everything I really want to know all about myself and everything that's going on. I had resistance to it. I had fear about it. But it was the thing that pulled me through a lot of stuff. This feeling that when it all came down to it, no, I, I value the truth. I want the truth. I want to know what is real and what is not. And if that means facing some hard stuff about myself, well, I might fight that for a long time, but in the end, I'm going to face it. So I'm telling you guys this stuff because this is work that you will have to do as well. I don't believe it's possible for us to truly embrace soul changes while we're carrying around a huge feeling of a lack of faith, a terror of emotional overwhelm, and a resistance to truth. We're just not going to be motivated. So what did I do to resolve these issues? Karina? Um, you exercised your will. I did exercise my will, but I had to do some other things in, involved in that. Glennis? Grow your faith on a daily basis. And how do you reckon I did that? I'm not sure. I've yeah. been thinking about that. Yeah. It's a good question, isn't it, Marco? Let's, let's try to answer the question, how do you grow your faith? Is that, you, is that what you can, yep. 
Yes. Educate yourself. Educate. Love. Educate. You know, I was doing a lot of those things through this engagement with truth. So my desire for truth was, was bringing me a lot of knowledge and education. But it was a lot intellectual because remember, I don't want to be overwhelmed emotionally. Justin? Just give it a go and see what happens. <laughs> Do you know what I did, Justin? I gave it a go, especially in the area of challenging addictions. And baby, I didn't grow any will, will muscle, but I grew a lot of the willpower muscle. I have a steely resolve. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get this. I'm going to get this. I'm going to prevent. And I went through, actually, some of the feelings that you are now starting, that are starting to be, you're becoming more conscious of. I felt miserable. Because I went, no, nah, I want this truth, and I can see its truth. So I'm going to use willpower. I'm not going to have my addictions, and I'm not going to do it, and I'm not going to do it, and I'm not going to do it. And this feeling came up for me. And it's a feeling that some of you are faced with at the moment. My lack of faith, my hopelessness, my feeling that there is no good, that nothing will work out in the end, it's all terrible, began to be exposed. And I had to grieve about that. My honour of truth continued to expose these feelings. And the fear of emotional overwhelm, gee, did that come up. And I began to grieve those things, Seth. Is that part of you feeling that you can't do it? Yes, the lack of faith in God and the lack of faith in myself. I, there have been so many times when I have... And I wish I could remember if it's in the Muppets or Sesame Street, but there's a scene where there's this, this puppet trying to play the piano. And he just gets so frustrated, he ends up bashing his head on the piano, just going, I'm never going to get it. I'm never going to get it. I'm never going to get it. And I've felt that feeling very many times. And I've had to let myself feel it, guys. You know, this lack of faith in ourselves has been with us pretty much since the incarnation, because our parents had it in them, you know. So this, this is what I want to encourage you towards. Like the, the, it's a very powerful talk that Cornelius gave to you on that first day with these three major factors. If you can grow your desire for truth and allow the feelings of a lack of faith to overwhelm you, then progress becomes possible towards what I'm about to talk to you about. Pierre? How long did it take to you to go through your lack of faith? And I ask that because I felt some lack of faith a few days ago, and I had a big overwhelming process, but it was short and probably not enough at all, but to have an idea of what it requires to go through this one. Or not. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Can I put the three up there? So, um, so my resistance to, let's just call it emotions, but by that I mean emotional overwhelm. So I, to work, I couldn't work through one in isolation really. Because in order to allow the overwhelm of the lack of faith, you know, I had to work through the fear of being emotionally overwhelmed. So you ready for how long that took me, guys? Five years. Maybe by my fourth year, things were getting a bit easier. But really? Five years. It's my continual engagement with truth every single day living with someone who exposed the truth to me through an external source every single day. And you know, I had to want that truth because it was very challenging. 
I was dealing with an extreme lack of faith and an extreme desire not to be overwhelmed. And I did run away heaps of times. But then, desire for truth brought me back. Linda? Uh, Linda, so Mary, how do you know when you're feeling those feelings of overwhelm and despair that they're actually your feelings, that you're in the truth of those feelings and not being overridden by spirit influence? Well, it just feels very personal. <laughs> like, it, I suppose I was facing truth at those times. So this desire for truth helped me stay in that process. Um, and I, I just, I suppose this is something where when you do want to cry addictively, when you want to feel like you're progressing by crying, it's, you leave yourself wide open for spirit influence when you're in an addiction with that. Um, but I suppose I didn't have that many addictions with that and I'd done enough work through those five years to feel the difference as well. But that again, it's between, when I say the difference, between feeling a spirit's emotions and feeling my own. So, so is it like a feeling that's, you know, really deep inside of you as opposed to more an intellectual experience? Definitely. Yeah. It's an overwhelming yeah. <laughs> experience of hopelessness. Yeah. yeah. But it's not angry. No. It's not angry. And I know some of you cry in this hopeless, they, you call it hopeless, but it's really angry about not getting your addictions met. So it's a very childlike kind of hopelessness, isn't it? Like despairing and... Yeah, is, that, I, is that right? Yes. It was yeah. not intellectual at all. Yeah. It's the feeling that comes from deep inside that there is that you have no faith in your capacity to change or in good or yeah. yeah. I suppose I'm not I don't really understand the confusion. I think the only way I can understand it is that perhaps you're referring to an angry, hopeless feeling, because spirits will definitely get involved with that. But when you're really feeling this feeling of a lack of faith, mm. it's your own feeling. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Jesus, would you like to add to that at all? Um, yes, I feel a lot of people are still worried about having feelings and so they ask questions about their worry about having feelings. If you truly engage your feelings, you will soon be able to determine when you're being influenced in a feeling and when it's actually your feeling. Mm. But, but see, most people don't engage their feelings first. So what they do is they want to intellectually know, is this a spirit or is this me, before they engage a feeling. And of course, at that point, you're never going to know because you're not engaging the feeling yet. So no. it's all, everything's back to front. Like you're trying to, you know, like many of your questions are about like engaging thoughts first before you have a feeling. That's not the way feelings are. You, you, you really, when you really feel a feeling, you don't have any thoughts about it, really. You just engage the feeling completely. Yeah. Yeah. And that, but that, but this fear, this questioning, is all about a fear of emotionally being overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. Linda's question is really about her fear about being emotionally overwhelmed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions before I move on? Anto. Mary, when you said you um, honour the truth in that moment, is it honouring the truth of that there's lack of um, faith or yes. just on that issue? Yeah, or I, I was... Conf I See, what a lot of us do in our personal lives is that we are living in a lot of addiction and we're comfortable allowing ourselves to see parts of it but not all of it. Mm. Or we don't really... We want to tell ourselves a bit of a story about our true motivations that, that aren't true. <laughs> what, we, what we want to say, oh, no, really, I wasn't angry. I was just, you know, feeling like uninterested or whatever. If you are confronting the truth, so often, again, this came externally to me, someone saying, no, you're really angry right now. <laughs> 
And I could have fought that, and I did initially, I fought that a lot. But I got to a point where I was willing to face the truth of that and go, yeah, I am. So emotionally acknowledge, yeah, I am. And that triggered my lack of faith because then I was like, man, I'm a really angry person. And I don't, and all of a sudden, oh, but I don't have any faith that I can change that. Overwhelmed me. When I'm just going, oh, no, I'm just a bit bored and disinterested, I'm not facing any truth. And my lack of faith in my own capacity to change or my feeling of hopelessness, if you like, about my current soul condition is avoided. So I'm honouring the truth about my life, about my feelings, about what's really going on for me. And then because I don't have any faith in my capacity to change or that God loves me, I feel desolate. And that overwhelms me. Does that make sense? And then, yes, I couldn't deny the lack of faith feeling of the truth of it. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And this is powerful, guys, and this is why the other two guys, Cornelius and Jesus today, have been talking to you a lot about facing truth about yourself. You know, the resistance to truth that we feel in the audience, that's showing that you are really resisting emotional overwhelm and your feelings of a lack of faith. You don't want to know the truth even enough to expose those feelings inside of you. And a lot of you, when truth is being presented to you here in the audience, it, ooh, it, there's error it's, that's being challenged by the truth. And some of you, instead of feeling overwhelmed, choose to project back out at us. Oh, I don't like this. Oh, I'm a bit confused. Oh, oh no. Hang on. You know, these kinds of feelings. And that's showing that you're resisting truth. And this truth has power, guys. This is the only way I changed was wanting truth about myself because that helped me through these other two massive, massive, massive blocks. Like when I'm saying I had a lack of faith, I'm not saying like a little bit. <laughs> it's a big lack of faith and it's actually something that I'm still working through, the feeling of hopelessness and, you know, fear about the future because I lack confidence in my own capacity to change. But this desire for truth is what's helping me through these things and growing my soul in this its ability, its, it's um, willingness to be overwhelmed and to stretch. Does that make sense? So I know it seems a bit scary that I said it took me five years, but I feel they were years well spent. <laughs> I had a huge resistance to truth, especially personal truth. And now... Just got a little one. <laughs> and that's liberating because it's, it's helped me, like, not fear truth as much. It's helped me have a lot more softness and compassion. It's helped me to begin to challenge addictions emotionally and to get to my hurt self. Like, I'm saying it was five years of hard yakka, and in the last year, wow, so much has changed for me in a very beautiful way. So that's why I wanted to introduce this talk and tell you a bit about my journey because some of you I've known for that length of time but I still see you resisting this truth and resisting these feelings. Some of you are better with emotional overwhelm than I was but you really resist the truth. You're going to have to work on all three of these things. Make sense? Okay. Oh, I keep forgetting I got a PowerPoint and I don't actually have to write on the board. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so I've covered this. Just that I didn't take personal responsibility for my addictions. It didn't mean, it meant that my will to love muscle didn't grow and my soul was very limited in its growth. And these are the things we've just covered. Okay. So before I was sincere about challenging my addictions, I had to deal with some of my feelings of a lack of faith. It wasn't all of them, just some of them. 
my fears about emotional overwhelm, my personal resistance to wanting God's truth. And then as I did this, my will to love began to be engaged. But if you think about it, my will to love was in its infancy as I honoured the truth, wasn't it? I was saying, no, I'm going to honour this truth. I'm going to seek it more. I'm, uh, I just did a really unloving thing. I'm going to have to face that, that kind of thing. Okay. All right. Now, Jesus, did you want to add anything to my introduction about this note? Lack of faith stuff? Cool. All right. So when we're practically challenging an addiction, we're going to have to go through all that intellectual deconstruction. And in fact, the emotional deconstruction applies as well. You've basically got the building blocks, you've got the tools for what you need to do. What I'm going to present to you is just some additional things that you will have to do as well. And they'll happen as a part of that process. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. So... The very first thing we're going to have to do was just up there on the screen. You can totally cheat. What was the very first thing we were going to, we have to do if we're going to challenge this addiction? We've moved from a state of intellectual awareness. Emotionally, what are we going to have to do? Rob? Acknowledge that uh, um, addictive interaction is sinful. Yes, yes. So we're going to have to, let's break it down into two parts actually. Yep, you're right. Um, we're going to have to acknowledge that the addiction exists, aren't we? So we're going to have to acknowledge what's going on here from an emotional perspective. And then we're going to have to acknowledge that this is involved. And this is where I see most people fall down. This is where I feel, as Jesus has pointed out to you in the last couple of days, there's a lot of chat about unloving behaviour. Oh, I've got these injuries. Oh, yes. Oh, there's my addiction. Oh, well, you know. It's become almost normal, hasn't it? Oh, oh, that's just me. That's what happens. And there's no emotional engagement with this understanding that it's a sin. Every time I engage in addiction, I harm myself, I harm my environment, I harm other people, I harm people I can't even conceive of right now. There's flow-on effects. So as we emotionally challenge uh, these addictions, the very first thing we're going to have to do is acknowledge that the addiction exists and that it is sinful. And for the last group, this was the most challenging step. Connecting to the sin of it. And to do that, you're going to have to want truth about it, aren't you? You're going to have to educate yourself about what's really happening and the effects that it has. Otherwise, you'll just be like, oh, everyone does it. Oh, it wasn't that big. It's only just a little thing. you know. But when we actually educate ourselves about what's happening in our soul and in the soul of others when we act in addiction, then we start to go, oh, wow, actually maybe it's a bit more serious than I thought. And if we work on our will to love, we're going to open up emotionally to the idea of this sin, to the truth of this sin. Make sense? Okay. What might be, now I can put that up. Actually, there's two really good questions I've put in here. You need to ask yourself, do I really feel that the addiction is a sin? And secondly, do I really feel that it's my responsibility? I know for me, a lot of times when I was in addiction, I was, I was in a situation where my fear was triggered. So I acted in a way that placated the people around me. And I would say, oh, internally, emotionally, I would go, well, no, that was a scary situation. I needed to do that. And that's me not taking responsibility for the sin that's involved and my free will choice to do something differently. And is, is rather than feeling it's my responsibility, it's saying, no, the situation created that choice for me. It wasn't my responsibility to do anything different there. 
Do you see that dynamic? Okay. All right. So now we've noticed it and acknowledged the sin. Huge, big first step. What are, we, what are some other things we're going to want to notice? Kadira? Kadira, um, I need to notice my emotional reaction to that. Yes, very good. Remember, this is a whole emotional process that we're engaging. With this challenge of the addiction, addiction, it's like we have to get to know the addiction emotionally. Most of us at the moment know it intellectually. And we can talk about the feelings, but we're not really getting to know them properly. We don't really want to acknowledge the sin part of these, these feelings that I wrote up this morning. So as we challenge this addiction, we're going to emotionally notice the compulsion, feel it as a sin, and then we're going to notice and feel the emotional response. And this is where, do you remember in Cornelius's talk, I put up my hand and I said, oh, Corny, I think a lot of people haven't yet reached this part of recognising how addictions feel in relationships because he was talking about things like it being icky and sleazy and all of those kinds of things. That's because there's not yet the emotional connection to the sin of it. It just feels good. Once we emotionally connect to the sin of it, then the good feeling is like, good, oh, oh, now that feels a bit off. I feel like I just did something against someone's free will or... Actually, I feel like, yeah, that really wasn't as purely motivated as I would like to think. And there's a new sensation starts to happen. So we want to notice our response to getting it met or not getting it met and recognise that you recognise that feeling from a new perspective. Does that make sense? Any questions so far? Lani? Uh, I'm feeling really like overwhelmed with this because like I really don't know my addictions like I think I'm in addiction all the time yeah and how do I even recognize like I've every moment or it's okay so let's talk about this a bit because honestly this talk is challenging because I'm asking you to challenge something that it, we've gone beyond just hearing about the theory of this. Now I'm, I'm asking you to engage a process and it's going to feel like uncomfortable. The last group felt really uncomfortable with what I was talking about because really I'm encouraging you to, yes, look at your life moment by moment. But the key is not to make this self-punishing. But it's how do you recognise when it's, is it by the feeling you get that yucky feeling? Yeah, you're going to have to do some work on the intellectual process, the intellectual analysis of what's happening in your life. Before, Remember I've said a few times, this all happens once you have an intellectual awareness, at least some intellectual awareness of the addictions that are playing out in your life. Okay, so it's to look at um, my daily life and all the interactions that happen within yep, it. Yeah, yeah, and to begin to be sensitive to the feelings that are happening. Before you have any acknowledgement of the sin, it won't feel so icky. But remember Cornelius's homework was to notice when you feel compulsion. Notice this, that's your homework for the next few days. Notice what's going on around you and when you feel like, oh no, I've just got to have another, I've got to have seconds at dinner. Or I just, I just didn't want to sit next to that person. You know, or I just had to sit next to this person. To begin to be sensitive to what's happening. This is the way you're going to start to deconstruct your addictions. Because a lot of them we think are normal. We think it's routine. <laughs> But also be aware, be, beware of getting judgmental with yourself. That's not, when we acknowledge sin, this is not about self-punishment. 
Actually, the acknowledgement of sin comes from the willful desire to love, to no longer harm. And sin, remember, is missing the mark of love. So when we want to be sensitive to the sin, we go, no, I want to know about this because I want to know what, where I'm not being loving. It's not because I want to berate myself or tell myself I'm a terrible person because actually that's just another addiction to help me avoid acknowledging the truth of what's really going on. So does that help, Lani? Yeah, yeah, okay. So next step, let's not judge the addiction. We've noticed it, we've noticed the feelings. If we get into judgment, we're going to derail the next part of the process. We're going to find that we stop in our tracks, we waste a lot of time, then spirits can get involved, then we get into more addictions of just like, I'm terrible, it's not going anywhere. Camilla? Yeah, if you just leave your hand up, Camilla, yeah. For me, it feels also important to, to remind me that th that's also a sin when I judge myself. I, feel I become unlovingly by my, to myself. Yes, yes. Well, you're, it's just another addiction, and you're going to have to be sensitive to the sin of that in the end, hey? A lot of us self-punishers have got a lot of work to do around just feeling how damaging that's been. Yeah. And it also, it, the thing about self-punishment is it's not just damaging yourself. It does damage people around you because while you're engaged in it, you are not dealing with the unloving behaviour. You're actually letting yourself off the hook of the unloving behaviour. You're saying, if I just self-punish about this, then I'll, if I self-punish long enough, then I've paid my dues for that terrible thing I did and I'm okay to keep going and doing it. Which is like a lot of the dynamic that existed in our families when we were kids, isn't it? You get the punishment, then you go on with life. And then we learnt to do it to ourselves, and even mum and dad, that placated mum and dad sometimes, oh yeah, I'm a terrible girl, okay, good, you were right then. Don't worry about looking at the causes or the consequences or the truth about what just happened, just punish yourself and, or receive the punishment and we'll move on. And a lot of parents didn't know what they were doing in that dynamic, but that's really what ends up happening. We end up doing it to ourselves. Cecily? I noticed that throughout my life when I've been thinking about um, these issues is a lot of the people that I felt angry and jealous of are the people who don't self-punch. Right. Mm. Why, oh, yeah. Interesting side note. <laughs> the people you feel jealous of people who don't self punish. Yeah, because yeah. they like themselves a lot more than I do. Mm. And mm. Yeah. Okay. Miranda. Yes. Um I'm struggling a little bit about what happened this morning. Um, I looked at, you know, like yesterday, supposedly the room was cleaned or, you know, clean the room yeah. on Wednesday. So um, I saw there were no more toilet papers and uh, there's a little bit of... Do you know what? I'm going to stop you right here. Firstly, because I want to cover the content oh, okay. of what I want to cover. But secondly, because I can feel your addiction in play. You have a big addiction to being looked after. You want, mm. and if you think about I spoke to you about this already this week, you want people to take care of you, make a fuss over you and care to the details and help you feel cared and nurtured mm -hmm. and you try to pull people into that all the time and your story is already showing me mm. that you, this is just about you feeling unloved because one of your addictions didn't get met. So I'm going to move on. Okay. Jesus? And you could also say the law of attraction is working perfectly to trigger this addiction and you are completely ignoring it. Yes. <laughs> no, yeah, okay. If you're feeling that that's the law of attraction at work, that's great. But I'm going to keep going with the talk. Yep. All right. Okay. So let's not judge the addiction. Shame and... This is not real shame when we get all judgy and self-punishing with ourselves. This is a way of avoiding dealing. Yep.
Hi, Mary. Hi. I'm Mel. Um, my question is about just the, w the word sin in general. Yes. So if I'm to take the next step and um, feel the sin emotionally, yeah. I'm kind of blocked on just the word because it um, comes with a lot of uh, feelings that I'm a sinner or a lot of judgment. You feel judged. Yeah. Yes. So yep. just that word So that's triggering. just another emotion that you're going to have to deal with, isn't it? This feeling of being judged. Yeah, Jesus wants to say. Yeah, can I point out some really important things that you're completely skipping over? Firstly, you are being judged by God, by God's laws. As soon as you sin, you are being judged by God. It should have a feeling of guilt associated with it. That's the reality. When it's a real sin, it should have a feeling of guilt associated because your conscience is pricking you. You've got all sorts of things going on. So, so you, you, this is why the word sin is such a powerful word because it connotates what it needs to connotate, and that is that from God's perspective, God's laws have judged you and found you to miss the mark of love. And also, God's laws are now trying to correct you. Right? So there will be also a compensatory effect, a feeling inside of your soul that begins where you go, wow, I am a sinner. Be, you are a sinner. That's reality. Every single person here is a sinner. In, in the first century, I used the term frequently because every single person is a sinner. Until they become perfected in love, you will remain a sinner, a person who purposefully chooses or inadvertently chooses to take unloving actions. So get used to the word. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, and the truth is God created a whole law to help us feel the sin. It's called the law of compensation. It's operating on your soul constantly. And this is how entrenched we get in addictions. We work so hard in addictions as to become completely desensitized to the sin that we're committing. Now that's a lot of use of will. Imagine if we could harness that and use it to love. You know, we are so entrenched in addiction that we don't even feel it's a sin. And yet God has a whole law operating every time we take an action out of harmony with love. Boom. There it is. A lot of you can relate to this as kids. You felt this sometimes, didn't you? Oh, I did something not nice. You know, you felt it internally. Oh. And sometimes you still feel it. But a lot of times you've shut down that sense of this sin. And this is the work to do. This is exactly what I'm saying. When you acknowledge the addiction exists and feel it as a sin, you are tuning into the law of compensation. It's a good thing to do. You're more in harmony with one of God's laws, darling. Um, I think the thing we need to do, though, is make sure that we, don't, that we understand that just because we are a sinner at that moment, that it doesn't mean that our real self, our, our final being, if you like, the person we will become, is, is always going to be a sinner. So this is where I feel the damage has been done yeah. by religion because they teach you that you're always a sinner, that there is never a process of perfection that will result. And, and this is where we need to make the distinction. We are not always a sinner because we have, the pro we have the ability to become perfected in love and therefore never sin again. And this is what part of what you're referring to, isn't it, Mel, this feeling that you will have to work through that has been placed upon you, that you are inherently bad. Yeah. Yeah. But the key is to work through that emotion, not resist the idea of sin. Do you see? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, guys. Do you know what? It's five to four, which is dinner time. So I would love to come back and finish this discussion with you at half past five, if you'd like to come. I think... Um, Jesus and I talked it over. It's not worth rushing through this stuff. Um, we've got the first three steps. You can mull them over as you have your dinner and um, we'll move on to the next ones when we get back. Okay, thanks guys.